I'm Dr. Jacob Strand. I'm the chair of the Enterprise Center for Palliative Medicine at the Mayo Clinic. I do a lot of work with patients with complex cancer-associated pain, pain in elderly patient populations, and today we're going to talk about opioid pharmacology and why it matters in the clinical practice. As we think about opioid pharmacology, it's really easy to get kind of taken away by the science of it, but it really matters as we think about the care for our patients and um, how that care impacts those around them, their caregivers, their loved ones, their work, uh, and their physical function. So in thinking about why it matters, I'll just talk to you about a case of a, a patient of mine, 63-year-old, advanced oxygen-dependent chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, had stage four chronic kidney disease and an unfortunate history of osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures. And unfortunately, came back into the hospital with really severe back pain from further fracturing of the lumbar spine. And as is pretty common, we see in a lot of our systems, patient got intravenous morphine in the emergency department, then got another dose on the floor, got a couple doses of IV fentanyl, again in low doses, and unfortunately was still in really severe nine out of 10 pain. And there was a lot of concern about how to manage this patient because of the medical complexity. And so um, this is, I think, a great case for us to sort of jump off on. You know, opioids in this setting or in settings like it are really effective tools in certain clinical cases, right? We know that there is an opioid epidemic and we have to be very cautious about how we use opioids. But in cases like acute severe pain for a patient in the hospital, um, patients with cancer-associated pain, and even in some chronic pain states, meaning certain clinical conditions, they are really effective tools in the setting of a multimodal analgesic approach. And although, again, while we're moving away from opioids in the case of minor pain, um, even minor acute pain in chronic, most chronic pain settings, when we can use it effectively, we can help improve analgesia as part of that multimodal approach, as well as improve function and quality of life. But for the patient, there's a really wide variability in terms of how well they tolerate these medications, the side effects, the risk profile they're willing to associate themselves with, the cost, and the route of administration, all which really impact how someone is going to tolerate these medicines. And for the clinician, there's a whole wide variety of things to consider as we try to provide the best care for our patients. And that might be the potency of the medication we're selecting, the side effects of the opioids and how those change from opioid to opioid, the metabolic pathway and the metabolites generated that will and should influence our choice of medication. Also have to think about drug-drug interactions, the conversion factors that all make this very complicated. But I think that when we do it well, the goal is that if we can find that right drug for the right patient in the right clinical setting, we really do improve the overall efficacy, reduce the side effect and the risk profile for our patients. So what about our patient with this compression fracture? Well, I think for this patient, it's really important to acknowledge that this is someone who is admitted to a hospital with severe acute pain. And so most likely we're gonna be using IV medications, particularly for somebody whose pain is in a severity of nine or 10 out of 10 with significantly impaired function. And the reason to choose an IV form is that we can get a quicker time to onset of action for this medication. And for most opioids given in an IV form, that time to onset of action is between three in 30 minutes, depending on the medication chosen in the patient. And we're going to get maybe 30 minutes to two or even three hours for some of these medications in terms of efficacy and duration. So that's going to give us some time to be able to judge response, potentially even need to redose, uh, and make sure that the side effects are, are tolerable. An important piece of this too is that even when a patient doesn't have an IV form, say outside of a hospital but still in an acute setting, um, in hospice patients, or for patients for whom we've lost IV access and we're still trying to gain um, the right route of administration, subcutaneous dosing can be really effective. There is a slower uptake to those medications and so we kind of think if maybe we think about a 10 minute time to onset for a dose of IV morphine or hydromorphone, maybe we're looking more like 20 minutes for a dose of subcutaneous morphine or hydromorphone. And for acute pain, um, in where it's maybe more moderate in severity or when we're in an outpatient setting where we need to use oral medications, those can work very effectively, but it's really important to make sure our patients are aware that that time to onset, that time to peak analgesia is gonna be much longer. That time to onset may be more like 30 or 45 or 60 minutes depending on the medication. 
And so when a patient comes to me and says, you know, doc, I tried this medicine, but it took like an hour to work. If it's an oral medication, that feels just about right. And it means that I need to do a better job of setting appropriate expectations for the, these medications. A couple of things that do come into play are a couple of no-nos that we just really have moved away from. And that's the idea that um, intramuscular dosing is really not needed, particularly when we have multiple routes, whether that's IV, sub-Q, uh, liquid medications, oral medications, or even rectal administration. IM administration or intramuscular dosing is really erratic. It's painful at the site, and it can lead to some different, different side effects that we may not expect. Fact. And then the other thing is that for patients who have an initial treatment where we're starting to treat acute pain, long-acting forms really aren't the most appropriate option because we're going to get stuck with a long-acting form even though the patient's clinical picture might be changing. So for this patient that we're talking about who's admitted to the hospital um, and we're trying to control their acute, severe pain in the setting of a compression fracture, we are probably going to look to a medication like parenteral hydromorphone, for example, along with other multimodal strategies, both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic. And that's because really in this patient, the other thing we need to consider is how these medicines are going to be uh, metabolized. So fentanyl, they already got and it didn't last long enough. Morphine Repeated doses of morphine are going to be really problematic in this patient with severe chronic kidney disease because of what's going to build up over time. And so in thinking about that, let's just dive into some of these different drugs we're talking about. Morphine, as I mentioned, probably not the right choice in this patient, is still a very good opioid. It's a prototypical opioid. It's very cheap. Lots of flexible dose options and routes can be given IV in a concentrated liquid sublingually. Um, can be given sub-Q, as I mentioned, rectally, and obviously in an oral form as well. It has long-acting forms in addition to the short-acting forms, and so it gives us a lot of dosing options. Um, it is metabolized by the liver, and that can be both good and bad. It's glucuronidated within the liver, and so that leaves a couple of clinically active metabolites, morphine 3 and 6 glucuronide, which are renally cleared. So in this patient, this is a real problem because that morphine 6-glucuronide in particular is going to build up and can lead to adverse respiratory outcomes for this patient. It's also something where we see that these metabolites can be neuroactive, meaning that in repeated administration, for, particularly for a very sick patient, can cause delirium, confusion, agitation, and even seizures. However, that glucuronidation is something that's helpful for patients who have other drugs that might interact at the CYP-P450 level that we may want not want to introduce another drug that interacts at that level. As we think about other medications, so the choice that I gave for this patient is hydromorphone, a really a common medication used orally in IV. Um, it's much more potent compared to morphine, um, and that allows us to be able to give smaller doses and potentially avoid some of those side effects, even though it is like morphine, glucuronidated in the liver, and renally cleared. It also has those flexible dose options, um, IV, sublingual, subcutaneous, rectal administration, and oral. And so it gives us those options to be able to treat patients in a whole variety of clinical settings. So why not fentanyl? I mean, we talked about how this patient received fentanyl in the emergency department and uh, on the floor. Great option because it's a potent analgesic, 100 times more potent than morphine. So again, we can use lower doses, get a good effect. It has rapid onset, a short duration of action, which is really helpful in a number of clinical scenarios. We think about the patient in the intensive care unit for where we're using this medicine for analgesia and even as part of a sedation protocol. We want to be able to adjust the doses frequently and monitor for side Side effects, patients with hemodynamic instability, or just patients that we're not sure which direction they're heading clinically, and we want to make sure that we're not overdosing for the effect that we desire. It also has a transdermal form, which can be used for long-acting analgesia in certain clinical scenarios. It's a medicine we reach for for patients with chronic cancer-associated pain, for patients with um, other chronic severe pain syndromes in a palliative care setting who might have really bad kidney function, bad liver function. But we do have some notes of caution in that, number one, as I mentioned earlier, it's a short duration of action. So for somebody with continuous pain, maybe not the best option. It also has a, a lot of interactions within that P450 system. It's metabolized through the 3A4 pathway, and so we do see drug-drug interactions with a number of different medications. It also is a serotonin potentiator, and this is something that has gotten a lot more recognition in clinical settings over the past five to 10 years, in combination with really common medicines like SSRIs, 5-HT3 antagonists used for treatment of nausea, we can induce serotonin syndrome with fentanyl products. And so understanding that is really important as we think about, again, that right drug for the right patient in the right clinical scenario.
Oxycodone is another medicine that we could use in an oral form in the US, really common medication. Um, it has, again, numerous different formulations, including short acting and long acting. And it's nice if we want to take acetaminophen out of the combination drug. So instead of giving somebody a combination of hydrocodone and acetaminophen um, or oxycodone and acetaminophen, we can use the oxycodone alone, get good clinical efficacy, and use the acetaminophen differently. It still has those drug-drug interactions, however, a CYP2D6 and 3A4 pathway. And so again, those drug-drug interactions and different clinical encounters based on the patient's genetics. And this is something that's gotten, again, a lot more appropriate attention as we realize there's a wide variety of patients who might be really rapidly metabolizing these medicines, slowly metabolizing these medications, all of which can affect how the drug works and the side effects that we see for those patients. And that makes this job that we have when we're managing pain and dealing with opioid pharmacology much more complicated. For those drugs that are active um, already in the system, people who are rapid metabolizers, it's gonna rapidly inactivate that drug. We're gonna have to use much higher doses potentially. And so that's a really important clinically as we see a patient who might be coming to us for, you know, that dose didn't work, that dose didn't work. That may not be addiction, that may not be aberrant behaviors, that may be really somebody who genetically isn't getting any efficacy with that dose. For other drugs that are pro-drugs, these P450 uh, interactions can lead to increased or decreased efficacy depending on the patient scenario. And so when we want to move some of the genetic polymorphisms out of the clinical decision-making, opioids like hydromorphone, morphine, tapentadol are all potentially good choices because they're not likely to have any genetic polymorphisms that affect the clinical outcome. You know, codeine is another great example. I, I would tell you that uh, the last time I used codeine was probably 10 or 11 years ago because codeine is going to have a variety of clinical efficacy based on the patient's genetics. And so understanding that allows us to choose drugs that are more likely to work consistently across populations. Another big issue besides the genetics is just what's going on with our organs. Is it somebody with chronic kidney disease or liver disease, or is it someone who's aging? In elderly patients, for example, you know, we see a lot of elderly patients who come into clinic or the hospital on tramadol, because I think clinicians are thinking, well, maybe that's a better drug, it maybe is a little bit less potent and maybe fewer side effects. And they're thinking about that appropriately. The problem is, is that we also know that elderly patients have decreased hepatic blood flow, leading to a variety of clinical effects, including medications like tramadol in terms of how they're metabolized. They have reduced glomerular filtration rate, so we're going to see increased toxicity in some of these medications like tramadol that are renally cleared. And so we have to be thoughtful about whether or not that's the right drug. And in most cases, it means that a medicine like tramadol in an elderly patient is probably not a good idea. Even though it's less potent, it has serotonergic and noradrenergic effects. We can see, again, those variations in genetic metabolism, and it's kind of a dirty drug, so we see pretty significant rates of dizziness and nausea. So even though some of these medicines are marketed as potentially being gentler or easier, that patient-specific factor gets really important. Another piece I just wanted to share, we talked about the renal. We don't talk as much about the hepatic concerns with opioids. And part of that is because it's just potentially not as recognized or because it has dual concerns. So for patients with hepatic, reduced hepatic blood flow or reduced hepatic function, we see that both those metabolic pathways are decreased and the metabolites aren't really cleared. So we see drugs that have a much longer half-life and at a varying degree of analgesia leading to dosing problems. We also see that as a patient with um, liver dysfunction has decreased circulating protein, we're going to see an increase in drugs that are predominantly protein bound and an increased generation of toxic metabolites. So really thinking about not just the patient's age, age their genetic uh, activity potentially, but also that kidney and liver function is really important. The last thing I'll talk about is, you know, thinking about these different right drug for the right patient, the right scenario is, you know, some of the side effects. Won't go into too much of the side effects because there's quite a few of them, but thinking about how we distinguish between some of the expected effects between uh, from actually how we treat a patient with pain. So the patient from the very beginning of our discussion is really somebody who's been in pain for a significant amount of time, is coming into the hospital, may not have slept, and when we give them the medications, their fatigue level or even wanting to go to sleep may not be actual sedation. It may be something like exhaustion. And we have to be careful because we absolutely know that opioids can cause sedation directly on the CNS and put patients in danger, particularly those who have underlying respiratory conditions. But figuring out what's sedation, what's fatigue, what's exhaustion and sleep de deprivation for patients with pain is really critical. And it's particularly critical for patients at the end of life for whom pain may have been the primary stimulant 
for them to be awake in the first place. And treating pain at the end of life, that expected outcome might be that they're sedated. And so it's important, again, to put this all in that clinical context. A few things that just to mention, because we didn't talk about already, are medications like methadone and buprenorphine. Methadone is a really important medication in the treatment of complex cancer-associated pain, in the treatment of pain for patients um, involved in specialty palliative care. And it's because it's a really inexpensive medication that's quite potent, both with potent opioid agonism as well as NMDA receptor antagonism, which we think um, is involved in reducing opioid tolerance. And so it allows us to rotate patients on to doses of methadone that might provide lower side effects and improved efficacy. It's also a medication that you can dose in numerous forms. It's the only long-acting medication that we can give in a liquid form or give through a gastrostomy tube uh, for patients who otherwise wouldn't be able to tolerate medicines like MS-Contin or OxyContin uh, because those medications can't be crushed. It is, however, a really complicated medication from the pharmacology perspective. It has a biphasic metabolism and can have a half-life uh, within the body of anywhere between 24 to 150 hours. And so understanding how to dose it, how to switch another opiate over to methadone is really, really, really critical. And so methadone really should only be used by a specialist in pain medicine or a specialist in hospice and palliative medicine. Another medication that we're seeing more and more of, and I think all of us are going to have to know more about, is buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is widely used in opioid use disorder treatments and is seeing more activity now in the treatment of chronic pain because its safety profile perhaps is a little bit better than some of our other opioid cho choices. It's a partial mu opioid receptor agonist, um, some weak kappa activity, very high affinity for that receptor and long duration in most forms, which again can be really useful in some patient cases, but very complicated for patients with acute pain given that significant receptor binding affinity. And so again, best in terms of somebody who's a specialist in this medication or in someone who's had advanced training in the use of buprenorphine. I think importantly, and just to close out with all of this, is that as we think about how to use opioids and the role that pharmacology plays, it's going to be affected by the patient clinical case. It's going to be affected by the patient's available routes of administration, their prior history with opioids and allergies, their genetic polymorphisms, underlying kidney function, and then ultimately how we understand the conversions between one opioid and another when we have to use repeated doses. And so again, getting to the right drug for the right patient with the right clinical case is critical, and always knowing that you can reach out for help when these cases become more complex. Thanks so much for, uh, for listening and chatting a bit today about opioid pharmacology. Um, hopefully we can continue this conversation with ongoing Mayo Clinic CME courses, and always feel free to reach out by a direct message or follow me at, at Jake J. Strand on Twitter. <laughs>